So, um, good evening, everybody. Um, as Harsha said, my name is Darla Goodwind. Um, I am from Papikasi's First Nations in Saskatchewan, not Pegasus or Peguist. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to share with you uh, this evening is a little bit of the context of uh, life prior to colonization, what our beliefs were. And I just want to also add that um, the, the pictorials that you see in front of you, although they are um, done sort of cartoon style, um, are very ancient. And um, I received them through ceremony, much like you would receive a pipe. And it took me 14 years to um, receive the first one. And um, a lot of a lot of our uh, people, of course, lived in uh, oral tradition, but we also did have our ancient scrolls and our ancient pictorials. And what you're seeing here are uh, the pictorials of my lineage. And um, the understanding that I'd like to share with you this evening um, is, is from my territory, and um, it's the basis on the treaties. Uh, my grandfather, Alexander Brass, was uh, one of um, the treaty signers in Treaty 4. And so um, this, is, this has been a, long, um, a long-standing relationship with uh, the family that I come from. Uh, my uncle, Oliver Brass, was the very first Aboriginal person in Saskatchewan to ever get his doctorate, and he taught at the University of Regina. Um, my grandmother, Eleanor Brass, started the very first um, Friendship Center in Regina. And so uh, my brother, Joshua Fraser, was also on the national executive uh, as the um, youth representative just a few years ago. So, so being present and, and there for our people is, has really been um, something that we've struggled to maintain and to strive over the years. And so um, the pictorials that you see here, I'm just going to ask that you don't write them down or, um, or try to reteach them because I only have a very few minutes to share with you and it's just to give you a small and a very brief understanding of, um, of where our traditions and, and um, our customs come from. And, and I know that all across Turtle Island there is a basis of these teachings that are very similar, although they might come in another form for, um, for, for various nations. So I just want to acknowledge that, and I'd also like to acknowledge the territory that we're on here today. And um, I put my hands up to um, the Indigenous people from these lands, and I also would like to say that um, I have passed tobacco and gone through my ceremonial work. I see Aiden sitting back there. And, and um, so I have in the past gone through our traditional ways of, of going to the territorial leaders and speaking to them and letting them know who and what it is that I do in regards to uh, for my people and have asked for um, ceremonial permission and traditional permission to do work outside of my territory. So I'd just like to say that. Good. So I, I think where we should start is um, really uh, our deep connection with our mother, the earth. And um, this isn't something that, that obviously we're all here in this room, that, that is taken lightly. And I'd like to give you just a little brief understanding of how deep and inherent those teachings are in our people and, um, and, and where that comes from. So I'm, I, I might struggle a little bit because it normally takes me two and a half days to do one of these. So I just have a few minutes and um, I'm going to do the very best that I can. So um, in the very first uh, pictograph or, or pictorial that you see, it says you'll see a picture of the sun there and there's one of the Mother Earth and one of the Grandmother Moon. Can everybody see that, kind of? Okay, so... Um, the, the grandmother moon and the grandfather sun are actually uh, considered to be the parents of Mother Earth. And um, the first helper of the creator is, is the sun, and he's a helper. And uh, the grandmother moon is, um, is a female energy. And they say that 13 times a year, the grandmother moon pours her sacred medicines down on the waters of Mother Earth to assist with her, her life. And so that's a cleansing process that the Grandmother Moon goes through. 
13 times a year, every 28 days, she becomes full and she pours her sacred medicine down on the waters. Our belief is that that's salt and that's why the, salt, or the waters are salty. Um, the grandfather son picks up that medicine and carries it over the Mother Earth and, and takes it over the lands and uh, a cleansing process happens every 28 days. The, um, when the grandmother moon pours those medicines down. And so um, it's a kindness that's done and it's done in a gentle way and it, it's, it's the beginning of our new life. So the, the male energy of the sun and the female energy of the moon are brought together to create new life. Um, every 28 days, the mother earth becomes full, her tides swell and she goes through a cleansing process as well. And that process is helped through um, the grandfather's son who picks up those medicines. So 13 times a year, every 28 days, the grandmother moon becomes full. 13 times a year, every 28 days, the mother earth becomes full. 13 times a year, every 28 days, all of us women become full and we go through a cleansing process which also takes four to seven days. The belief of our people is that we are fashioned after the mother earth. Um, our teachings of origin say that uh, at one point in time there was just one big landmass and that there were four sacred mountains and that when we were lowered here, woman first lowered to earth we believe was a black woman and when she was brought here she was brought with the knowledge of how to live in a good way on the mother earth and we were given teachings and from that first woman were the four races created. These teachings were given to all the people, to every race and um, those teachings included the teaching of Mother Earth that she is a living, breathing being, that she has a heartbeat in the, in the core of her body. She has lifeblood. She has um, lungs. She has bones, the rock. She has joints, the coal, the oil. And that as long as we didn't disturb these things, that we would be able to live in on her in a good way. I just want to read something um, from the uh, Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And it says, prior to European contact, indigenous populations were strong and healthy with diverse and com complex societies and languages. Women were valued and held in the highest of leadership roles. Violence against women and children was unheard of and went against values and principles and all beliefs. Children were raised according to the values of the sacred circle and resource rich environments provided abundant, healthy, organic food and, left, and life was thought of as ceremony or prayer. Prior to contact, the Aboriginal people of this land lived here for 25,000 years with a population of over 50 million. 50 million people in the land was untouched. So if you could imagine that now, that's double the amount of people that are here. And you're gonna hear a lot about the colonization process and what happened to our people and the genocides and the assimilation that has been um, happening until today. And I'm not gonna to speak to that. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of how many people lived here. Even our clothes were designed to not leave footprints on the earth. We wore fringe and we did the things that we needed to do in order to live here in a good way because we had the idea and the understanding and still do that we live on a living, breathing being. So with that connection um, of the female energy, and the grandmother moon, the mother earth, and the women and the 28 day cycle, I don't know how many of you know a lot about our ceremonies, but these numbers are very sacred to us, 27, 13, four, seven. This is the reason why. Um, we were told that there were four uh, sacred directions and that each one of us belonged there and that we would carry the teachings. And as long as we lived on the Mother Earth and understood that we were to, to be the stewards and the caretakers and to make sure that um, we lived here in, in the way, in the natural law and the inherent way that we were given as human beings by the Creator to live here, that we would always be able to live here. Um, and this is, this is the natural law that our ancestors, my grandfather, was going by when they went to go sign those treaties. And that the land was to be shared and that if people were coming that we would live here and that 
in that good way that we know how because we didn't believe that there wasn't any human that was less valuable. There was no racism or, or you know, we hear a lot of things about warring and, um, you know, we see things on TV that are so incorrect that really uh, hinder the ability for people to understand our people. And so this is actually a very exciting time because along with these pictorials come our prophecies and our corrections. And our prophecies say that the women would rise up and that the men would know when it was time to follow, to stand up against the oppressions and, and the things that we face. And, and we know these things because we still do ceremonies. We haven't been assimilated. We're, we are not disappeared. We haven't gone, we have gone through genocide, but they were not killed off. So um, our knowledge is alive and well in the drums and our elders and our women that sit here. And so it's the women who lead because we have that sacred connection through life giving and we share a cycle with the Grandmother Moon and the Mother Earth. And that gives us the understanding of how to nurture, how to um, do many of the things that, that, that family structures need to have. We have the teachings of the male and the female energy. Our men at one time knew that they, that son, yes, could, could burn that Grandmother Moon but he worked with her in a kind and gentle way. And through, through the teachings of that kindness of, of, the, of the grandfather son, working with the, with the grandmother moon, through her sharing with Mother Earth, the Mother Earth was able to care for all of us. And that's the beginning of the red road or the sweet grass path and the beginning of our teachings of humanity. And um, so when you look at a braid of sweet grass, you'll see the that braid there, that's known as the sweet grass path or the good red road. And within there you see the, the teachings of the kindness, caring and sharing. On the bottom is the time of the innocence. And you'll see that there are no babies drawn there because they're innocent and we know who they are. So the sweet grass is all loose on the bottom. And this is, these are the teachings that we live by through our entire lives. Um, there comes a time where there's a tie and that's, that's when our, our youth went through they were coming of age and they were taught these things. They were taught about living on the Mother Earth, how young men and young women were to live together. And um, you'll see the braid gets thicker and thicker where the adults are. And it was their job to work and, and take care of the community. And the elders' job, you'll see it's getting thinner there. And that was their time to rest and to teach the young ones. And then there's a tie in the top and that represents that spiral and the, the road back to the Creator. And so that's part of the natural law we lived in. I feel like I'm not doing our teachings justice right now. And um, there's a lot to be learned in, in uh, just these pictorials that, that I can't tell you about because if I start talking, you won't be here till tomorrow and no one else will get a chance to speak. But I, I really feel like um, in order for, for people to have an understanding of what the vision was with the treaty signers, and where that came from. Yes, we had our men go forward and, and, and talk and, and create these treaties, but they were done so by the women. We had clan mothers that took care of different territories. Um, if the people were to move or they were going to uh, migrate, the, the clan mothers would be the ones that would say, okay, we're gonna go here and we're gonna gather. And, and at gatherings, um, that's when things would be shared. And so, uh, when, when they sat down and smoked what people call a peace pipe, in my understanding there is no such thing as a peace pipe. We smoke the pipe for many reasons. And um, there could be a teaching that I don't know. Uh, but in my understanding, we were there and we were doing this work in our way. And so our understanding when the treaties were signed was much different than what was going on for the government. Our understanding was that the lands would be there and that they would be held for the people and that people would be able to fish and hunt and that we would live on them in a good way. I'm getting the stink eye. <laughs> so so um, that's a little bit of the knowledge uh, around what our people thought about and, and what the intent was when they were going into create these treaties. So we knew that we had people coming and there was going to be a lot of people coming and there had been wars down in the United States and we didn't want to see that happen. And we knew that there was enough land to take care of everybody. There was enough fish, there was enough deer, there was enough of everything. There still is if we take care of it. 
However, um, that's not what happened. And unfortunately, um, our people um, lost a lot of their abilities and, and to travel and to do the work that they did and to be able to live off of the land and um, were forced to live in, in places where they would starve and become very sick. And so we knew that that was the beginning. We knew that that was the beginning of when things were going to drastically change. And I know that someone else is going to speak to colonization, so I'll just leave that. But um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. So thank you very much. <laughs>